Great, thank you very much. It's a, it's a real pleasure to be here today. Um, I'm from, uh, 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 as David said, my name is Barry Downs. I'm here from Sure Valley Ventures. We're a London-based uh, venture capital firm. And uh, let's see if I can highlight something here. This, uh, the pointer work. If you look at the, I, I'm not sure if the pointer works here, but if you look at the building in the center, the white building there, that's 20 Fenchurch Street in London, and that's where we're based. Uh, and anybody who, who's here from England will know this is a very famous building. It's concave. And when it was first put up, it concentrates sunlight and kind of creates a James Bond-style laser that lasered a Jaguar on the, on the pavement below. It's also called the Walkie Talkie Building. And uh, we're, I suppose, we're very, very bullish on VR and AR technologies. Uh, and we take a long-term view on it. In, in terms of our portfolio, uh, we're allocating about 50% of our portfolio, our investment capital, into the AR and VR space. And we're investing in, um, I suppose, software startups and software startups in a variety of sectors in the AR and VR space. So while I know there's been quite a bit of talk over the last day or so about, you know, that we're in the hype cycle and we've gone over the top of the hype cycle and we're kind of in this valley of despair before, uh, it, we, we go up and have further success. Uh, we still see enormous achievements having been made in VR and AR. And when we look across our portfolio, taking a 10-year view, we see enormous opportunity in this space. And we also see enormous opportunity in learning and development. Oops, can I just go back? And part of the reason for that is there's already substantial investment in this space by major providers. Um, you know, the Facebooks, the Googles, HTC, Samsung, tens if not hundreds of billions of dollars have gone in here already uh, in the AOR and the VR space. And that creates enormous opportunities for startup companies to leverage these platforms uh, to create uh, the software companies of tomorrow. And uh, this I guess the, the video that's playing as well just shows um, you kind of the potential of VR in terms of presence. So I'm not going to talk too much about VR itself because from what I saw yesterday, people are pretty familiar with the technology, pretty familiar with presence and the potential of the technology. I'm going to talk a little bit more about uh, the market opportunity, where we see it going, and I'm also going to talk about immersive VR education and the Apollo 11 experience, uh, because Immersive has pulled off a very, very neat trick in an early market, which is um, to start a small software company with very little funding initially and produce uh, one of the products that's been um, the most, one of the most co biggest commercial successes uh, since the launch of VR in particular. So I'll talk through that a little bit and some of the lessons that we've learned. So. Um, so first of all, just to talk about the market opportunity here, um, you know, there's a number of analysts that have looked at this space, uh, and you'll see forecasts. So there's one here from Research and Markets to go from a $3.9 billion market right now to a um, $108 billion market by 2021, and a CAGR of 94%. Now, the only thing I can tell you about that is I know that's going to be wrong, uh, because it, it's impossible to predict the future. Um, but what I would say is if you look at the bottom left-hand side, um, that's probably the thing that I look at most closely, which is that um, this is a model of diffusion of innovation over time, uh, starting with the PC, and, and you're looking at classical S-curves here of new platforms that emerge. And what that picture shows is that every time we have a new platform emerge, uh, we have big billion dollar winners in the space. And starting with the PC, you'll see Wintel were, were, you know, had huge uh, success. So Windows, Microsoft, and Intel. Then moving into the internet, we had obviously Google and Facebook. Moving into the mobile platform, we see Snapchat, we see Uber, and Facebook's not been too shabby in that space either. And now moving into VR, and AR and mixed realities, 
we're still at a very, very early stage, but we are starting to see opportunity emerge. And this is uh, one of the reasons that we'll see huge software companies being built in this space. And w our job as a venture capital company is to identify as best we can the companies that have an opportunity to become billion dollar companies that are very, very scalable companies and invest in early stage and then help grow and build those companies. Um, one of the other things that I think is important to recognize is, you know, there's huge drivers for AOR and VR adoption. Um, Starting with mobility, I mean, uh, I saw somebody talk about yesterday, I think it was Max spoke about, you know, really a VR headset is a, is a mobile phone strapped to your face, even, even in the more sophisticated ones. Um, and that's right, mobility as a, as a platform is morphing and creating new types of products. Uh, drones would be an example of that. Drones really is a mobile phone in the sky. <coughs> and also uh, AR and VR is a great example of that as well. Um, and this is driven by faster networks. So we've gone from 2G to 3G to 4G right now, and 5G coming up, uh, increasing the speed at which we can access data and deliver data. Uh, and also just general improvements in all of the technologies that we're using in this space, driven by Moore's Law. And what's interesting uh, about AOR and VR is new software tools, <coughs> such as Unity, making it easier to create content and then really, really powerful value propositions, immersion for virtual reality. And anybody who's experienced some of the demos here will um, uh, just understand the power of that. And augmentation then of, of the real world uh, with digital information in the AR space. So these are very, very powerful value props. And then you have these platforms Think about all of the innovation that came about from the Windows PC and, and the Apple PC in the early days, and from iOS and Android in the mobile space. And look at all of the platforms that have been created here. And this is from EDG Capital as well, categorizing those platforms. And you'll see the, the major platform vendors there, such as Oculus, uh, you see Samsung Galaxy Gear, you'll see HTC, you'll see Microsoft, you'll see Magic Leap, uh, when they uh, release their product. So these platforms are going to create great opportunities for new software companies to emerge, and also great opportunities for education and for training in the uh, enterprise and industrial environments as well. And then the other kind of wind at our back for this space as well is there's a lot of investment has already gone in to AR and VR uh, platforms and software companies and there's a lot more to come in. We're really, for, as a fund, we're at the start of our cycle. So we're in year one of our VR fund, uh, and we're gonna be investing in VR companies for the next five years. And that's why we can take a long-term view. Uh, typically, companies take five or six years to get to exit, a little bit longer sometimes if it's IPO. So we're looking across the 10-year time horizon and just seeing enormous opportunity for startups, and for technologies, that, um, and for education, and also for training as well. So I want to talk a little bit about, uh, so I have a lot of personal experience of this in addition to running a fund. And it's very, very small. You might not be able to see it. But if you look at this, um, this map of European VR companies, in the top right-hand side, you'll see uh, immersive virtual reality education. And this map is produced by our, our friends here locally, the VR Fund, uh, who are investing in Silicon Valley, but also investing internationally as well in AR and VR. And um, it's one of the ways of categorizing the, technolo the technology landscape in AR and VR. And you'll see um, we would use these maps extensively to uh, analyze and categorize companies. So let's talk a little bit about immersive. So, Having said, we think there's enormous opportunities here. We already have an example of a company that's produced a product, which is the Apollo 11 product. Uh, can I just see who here has tried Apollo 11? OK, well, actually, I'll, hopefully, uh, I'll, I'll get a few more of you to try it afterwards. And it's, it's great to see uh, some recognition for it. So let's talk a little bit about this company. 
So Immersive was uh, established in 2014 by a husband and wife team, Dave and Sandra Whelan. And uh, the Apollo 11 VR experience is about the journey to the moon. And it puts you in the seat of Neil Armstrong going to the moon. You get to go all the way there, you get to land on the moon, and you get to come back. And it's a very powerful and immersive experience. And uh, I'll show you some of the reaction to it as we go through the presentation. Um, the company also has an education platform. And I'll talk a bit about that as well. So the education platform is called Engage. And that's a social learning platform. And Max was talking about yesterday about the need for tools uh, to be able to create and deliver learning experiences and education experiences, uh, and to do that in a social environment and engage as that platform. And then on top of Engage, um, the uh, Immersive have built two signature experiences. And these are better thought of as edutainment. So they're his, Apollo 11 is historically accurate, but it's also very entertaining as well. And those signature experiences in the early market that we're in right now with AR and VR um, are really designed to capture people's imaginations and bring them into uh, a learning environment. So let's, uh, uh, I'll, I'll skip that for a second. Let's just show you what uh, Apollo 11 actually is because uh, I know a number of you have not tried it. Oops. All right. I believe that this nation should commit itself to achieving the goal before this decade is out of landing a man on the moon and returning him safely to the earth. No single space project in this period will be more impressive to mankind or more important for the long range exploration of space. And none will be so difficult or expensive to accomplish. So, um, as you can see from the video, Apollo 11 is this very emotional experience. Um, really, uh, what, the, what the founders of the company did is they selected something that I think was perfect for a very, very early market in VR in particular. The product launched uh, in April of last year uh, and pretty much launched at the same time as the Oculus Rift and the HTC Vive platforms. And later on in the year, uh, towards the back end of the year, once PlayStation launched, it also has become available on PlayStation. Um, and the reason I think it was, it was a kind of an inspired choice, because this has been a very, very commercially successful product. One of the most, uh, in terms of both revenue and in terms of recognition. And, and I think one of the reasons it was an inspired choice is because of the demographic of that early VR market early adopters who many people would be very interested in space type experiences. The other thing is an educational experience though, because as, as I go through this, you'll see that this, there was a real passion to keep this as historically accurate as possible. If you think about um, the founder of the company, Dave, uh, he, he often says if you look through history and you look at significant historical events, quite often you know, they're about wars or they're, um, uh, other kind of similar events, and he wanted to pick something that was inspiring. And the moon landing is one of the most inspiring events in, in the history of humankind. So he really wanted to do that justice as well. 
Um, and also virtual reality was just the perfect environment to deliver something like Apollo for a number of reasons. First of all, in terms of scale. And this is one of the things that really struck me when I went into VR, first of all. And um, it's hard to describe to people who have not experienced it, which is that things seem the real height that they are. So that rocket's about 350 feet high. And when you, when you come into Apollo in scene two, you start at the top of the rocket, you get, you get a panoramic view of um, Cape Canaveral, and then you, you kind of pan down the rocket, and you come to the base of it, and you look up, and you get that sense of height, and, and, you, and you, re you really feel like you're standing right next to it. So very, very powerful, you get the sense of scale. You also get a sense of movement as well, so um, the, the video on the left-hand side is Rift Coaster, um, so if you watch that closely, you might feel a little motion sickness over the next couple of minutes. Um, now, we weren't trying, in this product, we weren't trying to, to induce motion sickness, uh, but we were able to use motion uh, to create this impression of, of blast off. And also, uh, and really the power of the blast off of the rocket. And then also, at another part in Apollo, uh, we can use a certain panning technique to induce a feeling of weightlessness. Now, it's only a sense of it, you're actually not weightless, of course. But you can do really, really interesting things in VR um, and create really amazing feelings within somebody uh, without, without making them feel sick. And then presence, I was at a number of sessions yesterday where, where presence was, was in, introduced and this feeling of being there. Um, the other thing about this is it's, it's a seated experience which is perfect for uh, the Oculus Rift launch because that really is a seated experience as well. And that seated experience really helps with, with, with the presence. And the design philosophy of Apollo 11 was that it should be accessible to everyone, old and young, and that it was historically accurate. Um, so the cockpits, you sit in the rocket and you blast off and then you land on the moon. The cockpits are historically accurate down to very, very fine detail. Uh, some of the Apollo astronauts, Charlie Duke, for example, have been through uh, Apollo 11, and uh, they highlighted where some of the, the instruments needed to be tweaked, uh, and that's been done. And then the live audio from the time is used as well. So when you're there, you, you hear the audio um, as it ran live at the time. But at the same time, it's edutainment because the whole idea is to capture and lead the imagination of the person that's in there and create an, an emotional connection and an emotional experience. So cinematic techniques are used, documentary techniques are used, and also music is used extensively to heighten the experience. So just a bit of background on how it was developed. <coughs> Excuse me. So some of the inspirations for this would have been 2001 A Space Odyssey, for example, or Apollo 13. Um, and it was built in a series of scenes, starting with JFK's favorite, you know, famous speech, we choose to go to the moon, and then going on to the launch pad, ultimately going from blast off to the journey to the moon, to landing on the moon, and then exploring it, and then going back home. And it's in a, a series of scenes. It's also part on rails, so you can sit there and really enjoy the experience, but it's part interactive. So you can do docking and undocking using a, using a game controller. You can land the limb on the moon using a game controller. And, and you can actually, um, you can go around on the moon and do the ex experiments that the Apollo 11 astronauts did when they actually landed on the moon as well. So it's part on rails, and, and actually there's two modes. You can run it entirely on rails or in cinematic, or you can run it in, in an interactive fashion as well. If you run it in cinematic, it's about uh, 45 minutes. If you do it interactively, it can be a number of hours worth of experience. Um, I myself, when, uh, you know, I was attracted to this because I'm a space nut as well. You know, I, I believe this is, uh, you know, the Apollo 11 landing was one of the most inspirational things uh, that we, as a, we as, a, as a species have done. And uh, just, I was just really, really into it. Um, and I thought I knew everything about it. And one of the really interesting things about VR is Dave and the team 
uh, to, to help you land the limb on the moon, they try to be very historically accurate as to how you control that spacecraft. It's a one engine spacecraft. And so you have to adjust the thrust and the angle of that spacecraft all the way down. And when you go into that section interactively, uh, it, it, there's, a, there's a visual as to how you should do it. Um, but then when you actually try to do it, it's actually very, very difficult to do. And I crashed and burned on the moon, um, I, I don't know how many times. And the interesting thing about it is I'd never really considered, even though I knew a lot about the moon landings, I'd never really considered what it was like to, f to, f to land the rocket, to, to pilot that rocket or the, the limb down. And, and I knew about it after. So I learned something new. In fact, I learned a number of new things from this as well. Um, and, and I think uh, as we go through, you'll see uh, just the impact it's had on some other people as well. So how it was developed uh, was broken into scenes. And then there were storyboards created for each scene. And, and there was interactive storyboards created for each scene. Uh, and then the team brought together the, the audio from the time and um, music to heighten the experience. And then they built prototypes. So I'm going to show you in the next video a very early prototype. Or actually, sorry, I think the next thing I'm going to do is going to show you audio. So yeah, so this is, this is the audio from the time being brought together with the music. And if you want to close your eyes, please do. It'll give you a sense, but you should be able to picture what's about to happen here. Okay, so once you bring the audio and the music together, uh, then we build a prototype. So you're going to see the prototype here now. So it's very early, kind of uh, almost like a rush. and you can move, you can move uh, your head to the window. The other thing is this is quite a tight environment and, and you really get a sense when you're sitting in the cockpit that it's a small environment. It, it's, um, I, I won't say it's claustrophobic, um, but you do appreciate how tight it was and, uh, and the conditions that the, uh, the crew were in as they went to the moon. And you can see uh, that's the person looking out, their head is tracked, you can see them looking out the window. And that helps create this very strong sense of presence. This is a pretty, um, the first time somebody experiences this, and they experience blast off and looking out the window and seeing the earth. It creates very, very powerful emotions. Um, and I'm going to show you that in a second. Um, ju just before I do that, there's some other things. Uh, we had some triggered events. So this is Charlie Duke from Apollo 16. And you can see he looks right and he, and he gets his thumbs up. Uh, so that's a little bit of AI, uh, kind of uh, very basic AI, which, sa which says that if somebody looks across at a certain point in time in the blast off, certain things will occur to increase the sense that they're actually there and presence and interactivity. Um, we also have timed events in there as well, where you're trying to heighten the motion by bringing together. This is a moon arrival, uh, and you see the at a particular point in time, at a, you know at a really emotional moment, and with the music to go with it and the audio to go with it, uh, you see the Earth rise from the moon as well, and that creates a, a very powerful experience. 
So let's, uh, let's see the impact that has on somebody on the next slide. But just to kind of conclude, in this edutainment experience, we're using actual images from the Earth and the Moon. We're using real cockpit audio and we're using historically accurate spacecraft. And actually that picture in the bottom right hand corner is, is more reflective of how the experience looks today. So you can see substantial progression from very, very early stage prototypes to what is quite a slick experience now for anybody who goes through it. <laughs> and here's somebody's reaction to it. It's the coolest thing ever, dude. <laughs> wow. It gets better. It's like, it's like I'm there, buddy. It gets better. Oh my gosh. <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> this is by far probably, this is my go-to riff thing when I want to show people what the rift is about because this is what it does. It makes it, it it's, it's incredible. It's Bottom unbelievable. Line. It is so unbelievable, buddy. Are you okay? Yeah. Are you uh, crying? Yeah. Oh, I'll wow. never I'll never get to do this, but here. This is incredible. Oh god. Um I think that's it. During the during the early days of this, um, I I would I've been involved in the company since its inception uh, because I love the material so much, and I would go out and I do demos. And I remember being in a very very swanky hotel in Mayfair and starting to do a couple of demos of this, and uh, suddenly crowds coming around to try it, and and I would normally do like no more than about three to four minutes of the experience. Everybody had you know, just this incredible emotional reaction to it. And I knew from that just how powerful VR is and just how powerful it is for teaching and for learning uh, and really educating as well. Um, in the end, I think we, we were swamped that day. And every time, we've, every time we demoed this, uh, we, we have been absolutely swamped by people who want to try the full experience. Uh, let me show you from an education point of view as so, well. Yeah, that was the end of the demo. Uh, I just, I'm recording uh, this end part because uh, my, unfortunately my webcam uh, stopped at the end there, but uh, I'm just gonna pretty much say what I said there and that this, this was absolutely amazing. Like this was just incredible. It makes me so happy that my, my rift, that my rift right here can make me feel feel such powerful emotions from something that wasn't even real. Uh, can you imagine, like, if you were back in high school and you were in your science class and you started talking about the Apollo missions, and instead of going through a long lecture about it, they gave you a VR headset and put you in this? How much how much more is that able to teach you than just someone talking, sitting up there talking about it? Not that it's a bad thing, but this is just so much more powerful. I, I felt like I was in that space shuttle with Buzz Aldrin, Neil Armstrong, and uh, Michael Collins. That was... Uh, I'm not crying, but I, I certainly feel like I want to because... <laughs> That's all I can. That's all I can say about it. I just, it, it was just amazing, and these guys did a fantastic job on it. You know, that's I'm definitely, definitely, gonna be backing them a lot now, because this needs to happen. This needs to become a thing. Virtual reality education, things like this, need to become a thing. Now, of course, he was crying. Um, <laughs> um, and I should, just, I should just drop back and give a little bit more context because although the product officially launched uh, in April of last year, uh, the company originally ran a Kickstarter and uh, it was a small Kickstarter and a successful Kickstarter and it had a lot of backers as a result of that. And it shipped very early prototype software. 
And this um, uh, young man was actually one of the early backers. And this was a video he recorded of himself and he put on YouTube. And, and this is very common. If you, if you Google Apollo 11 VR on YouTube, you'll find a whole series of you know, uh, thousands of people who've recorded themselves in it and put it up online and said very similar things. And it's quite universal as well, because you'll find them in all different types of countries, all different types of languages, uh, and it's, you know, all kind of coming back saying the same thing. Wouldn't it be amazing if all of our education was like this? And I, I certainly would have seen yesterday in the, in the learning and training uh, field as well, you can, see, you can see many, many use cases where this would create kind of muscle memory and be a very powerful thing. Um, so that's Apollo. Um, I should say um, it's now available on PlayStation uh, US. It was, only became available a couple of weeks ago on PlayStation US. Uh, the PlayStation approval process takes a little bit of time. So we did Europe first, uh, US is now live, and now we're moving on to Asia. And the other interesting thing about this from an early market perspective, the company kind of iteratively built the product and improved the product over time. So the product that's launched on PlayStation US now is a substantially more polished product than the first version that was launched on Apollo or, or on Oculus in April of last year. So that iterative development in the market is, is I think, an important feature of early markets as well uh, for software companies. So they didn't expend a huge amount of, of cost in terms of developing the product to get it to launch. And as it made money, as it drove revenue in, then they put additional resources in there to really polish it up. And it's got to a, quite, a, quite a high level now. Um, so what's next for the company? Um, the company, in addition to the education platform, which I'll talk about in a minute, is launching Titanic VR, which is a very, very similar uh, type of experience. Um, uh, and it, it has cost a lot more to make because it's a lot more interactive as well. And the, the first part of that is launching in September. So hopefully I've got a trailer here for this. Um, the company also won, won a, a whole range of awards for Apollo as well. This is Titanic. I thought she was something out of the ordinary, my gosh. She was the last word in luxury. All her public rooms were absolutely amazing. All the woodwork was beautifully carved. She had everything, everything that you could think of. That they, she was a beautiful ship. You see, we were, we were on a ship that was unsinkable. Sorry about the judder on that video there. Oh, I mean, move that forward. Um, so the, the product is really in two parts. There's a, a, a dive the Titanic experience. So if you've, uh, I'm sure everybody's seen the movie. Uh, after the movie, David Cameron released a, a, um, a documentary about him diving the Titanic. 
And so the first half of it is really that type of experience. It's fully interactive, fully gamified. But again, it retains this kind of historical documentary quality to it as well. So as you're diving to Titanic, you can learn about who, which, the, which person was in which stateroom, for example, uh, information about how deep it is, about uh, at the background to the ship as well. Um, and, and again, just it, it's a way of trying to deliver really substantial historical information to participants in an engaging and uh, an emotional way. Um, so that's the first half. The second half is more like an on-rails Apollo, where you um, join the Titanic in its maiden voyage, you're on board when it hits the iceberg, and then you're, um, from, a, from an observer point of view, you join one of the lifeboats, um, and you're witnessing everything that's going on as you're joining that lifeboat. And I, I was in some of that material before I came over, and it's in incredibly powerful, incredibly powerful um, material. Uh, and, I, and again, it has this historical aspect to it as well. Um, and again, this is an event in history that I think has captured people's imaginations. Uh, there's been successful movies in this space. And I think this is a, a good expansion from an edutainment point of view for the company as well. Now, a couple of interesting things. As the early market develops, the company's putting a lot more investment into this product. So day one when the product comes out, it's going to cost a lot more to build, um, and it's going to be a much more sophisticated experience. And the team is staffed up to do this as well, uh, in terms of animators, model makers, developers. Um, and so this, this will be a high profile experience when it comes out. And, uh, we're getting, we're not quite in triple A gaming land yet, uh, but we are getting to the point where the expectation of experiences and VR games when they come out, they're higher than they were last year. And I think this inflation of expectations will happen year after year until we get to the triple A um, pers perspective on these experiences. So uh, the other thing is, whilst Apollo appeal to the very early demographic, um, which, which would be very interested in kind of space type experiences, a kind of a gamer uh, demographic. The company is taking a bit of a risk here that uh, the market is expanding and, and a broader demographic is, is going to engage in VR from the point at which this product is released. Um, so it'll be very interesting to see how, how, it, how it goes. Uh, we believe, and certainly I believe, having seen uh, and having experienced a lot of Titanic, I think it'll have just the impact that Apollo has had, um, and even more so in many cases as well. The other thing then as well is, uh, at the start I was saying that the company builds these signature experiences to get them into the engaged learning platform, the social learning platform. And there's going to be accompanying um, uh, material in Engage, once somebody's gone into the Titanic experience, they can come in to Engage and they can learn an awful lot more about uh, shipbuilding, the Titanic, um, media from the time, 3D photos, and also documentaries on Titanic as well, traditional 2D documentaries. So all of that's been put together to encourage a much broader learning experience uh, driven by this powerful emotional content uh, that people go through. So, a bit of background on Engage. I'll let the video talk for itself. It's, it's not just something that's a bit different. This is a new medium. It's not what we've been traditionally doing. I think if we can turn learning into a hobby, I think people are going to really, really enjoy Engage. It's going to be extremely disruptive and exciting times ahead. Immersive VR education is dedicated to transforming the way educational content is delivered globally using virtual reality technology. We design uh, educational experiences like the Apollo 11 experience, and then we also have our own education platform called Engage. Essentially, Engage is a distance learning tool um, that we can use to basically put educators and students together in the same room with digital representations of themselves so that they can focus on sort of any topic that they want. You can have your teacher, you can have your students with you, and you can go anywhere in the world or beyond and learn about really anything there is to learn by immersing yourself in that educational experience. It is going to help 
so many people that have difficulties with the current educational modes that we use. It's a very exciting new platform and a new medium to explore, and that's what we're doing here. The first idea that pops into anyone's mind when they try the technology, they'd see it as an extension of the games industry. But actually, there's so much more potential for how it can be used. There's a lot of educational experiences you can have which involve some type of game. And we're talking about immersing students who are used to playing games. Well, it is very much uh, the same type of experience that you're coming out of it learning something as opposed to, you know, shooting people or, or something. <laughs> I mean, we're all becoming more and more educated as the years go on. There's just global academic inflation going on. But obviously we have a lot of challenges with that in the form that we can't necessarily create enough teachers to teach all the people who need teaching. What VR sort of allows us to do is bridge that gap and allow us to get bigger classrooms but with more intimate interactions between educators and students. It's totally different to a dry historical lecture. You feel like you're there. You feel like you're in the experience. You can transport your classroom to a different location or a different time and see some of these historical events as they happened. It's a world of your own creation, which is great for educational environments. You're not just limited to a diagram of what it's like on the space station. You can explore the space station and see exactly how things are put together. Do you feel a visceral kind of emotional reaction to what you're experiencing, which is fundamental to how we form memories? Oh my God! <laughs> you learn a lot more doing a hobby than you do if you're like forced to sit down and read a book. The students are engaged the whole time and what they take from it is memory, and that's how you get your brain to remember these things. Let's learn it by living it. Being able to use VR is a really vital technology of getting people involved, and it completely changes the way you learn things. Essentially, we can have a lecturer or an educator use the entire space, which is great because it, it gives a greater sense of presence and allows the lecturer to communicate more clearly with the students. Sitting down in the one place doesn't make sense anymore. You want to get up. You want to go out and experience what you're looking at. And then having hand presence as well, it just opens up so many possibilities. Well, having all these together, it really hits like the sweet spot in terms of the experience that you I should say there, actually, you might have seen um, Mike uh, draw a HTC uh, that wasn't a subliminal plug for HTC. It's actually HTC came and recorded the video, which is why I think he probably felt obliged to promote the company in a way. Um, so uh, so I, I'll go through a little bit of background as to how the company positions itself in the market, and I think that might be interesting for everybody to see. Um, so the primary positioning around this is um, as kind of a next generation MOOC. Um, uh, but the, the company is also, so it's, it's, it's launching two versions of the product, one of which is a MOOC-style service uh, like Coursera or edX, and then the second one is a platform for enterprise, uh, and that's for uh, education and training in, in the enterprise space. Uh, but I'll primarily focus on, on MOOC for the moment. Um, and so if, if you look at some of the challenges with MOOCs at the moment is, is, is really the primary challenge is the completion rate on, on MOOC. It's, it's less than 16% in terms of uh, people who sign up for courses on MOOCs complete those MOOCs. And there's a number of reasons for that. Uh, one is the impersonal nature of MOOCs, two, and two is the lack of, um, uh, of social interaction on MOOCs as well. Um, and this graph probably highlights that in a more detailed way, where you're seeing you can actually break down participants in, in MOOCs into lurkers, drop-ins, per, uh, passive participants, and then active participants. And, and I have to admit, um, I'm, I'm a big fan of MOOCs, and, and I've, been I've definitely been a lurker, which means that I've signed up and then not done anything, uh, and just had a look at it. Uh, I've definitely been a drop-in, where, where I've just picked up some uh, particular videos that were interesting. I've been a passive participant in some MOOCs. I've, I've never really been an active participant in a MOOC, though. Um, so I fit into the top three. And I, I think a lot of people are like that as well. And, and part of it is I, I, I do think this, this lack of social interaction and the fact that you're just watching kind of 2D videos. Um, so uh, there's been a lot of studies of the dropout rates on MOOCs and the reasons why. Uh, and they, they basically boil down to three reasons. One is this human contact element is missing. In, in education, uh, and, and I'm sure you guys know this better than I do, in education, 
this human contact, whether it's in undergrad or graduate education or K-12 education or education in corporations, um, having a teacher is, is an important thing. Also, being able to engage in peer groups is a very, very important thing as well for education and learning. And then being able to collaborate around education content uh, is a key thing as well. And MOOCs have come up with a variety of systems to support that, but none of them, none of them really have kind of nailed that issue. And we do believe that VR is an environment in which you can nail those issues. Uh, the other thing, uh, just as, as a bit of background, to all of this, and, and, and this, I guess, uh, supports the company's drive to get into this space. You know, the cost of education here in the US, you'll know that in particular, cost of education has gone up dramatically uh, since the 70s, uh, over a thousand percent. The average cost of an undergraduate degree, for example, has gone up dramatically. Um, so for a, going from a two-year degree, $17,000 all in up to, per year, up to a four-year college degree, you know, approximately $49,000, $50,000 all in. Uh, and there are, obviously, that's the average, there are more expensive places as well. Many of them in this, you know, Stanford and Berkeley and uh, in this part of the world are very, very expensive uh, to go to. So it's, it's pretty expensive to get educated. And because of that, the cost of debt around this has gone up dramatically as well. Uh, so those two graphs show the, the, um, the average student loan debt versus inflation uh, since uh, 2003 to 2017. And this is something that everybody knows here in the US. You know, everybody knows you may be in the position where you have student loans from, from going to college. Uh, and this is a particular problem. Now, and across the world, if you look beyond the US, if you look internationally, um, there's a huge demand for education. So if you look at uh, top 10 places of origin of international students coming here to the US, China dominates that at 31%. But India is increasing the entire time uh, and will become a very large part of that as well. And demand for online learning is growing just as quickly as well and particularly from China. China's online education market alone is set to be about 2.3 billion by 2019. So there's large opportunities for companies to get into the online education space. So the kind of conclusion that the companies come to, and I would put it to you and love to get your feedback through the rest of the day, is that current distant learning um, platforms have major challenges, and one of them being very low com uh, completion rates. And these are really related to engagement, participation, and the isolation that some people can feel in these platforms. But the demand for this type of education is soaring, not least because of the costs of traditional education and the benefits and opportunities with online education. And also there's going to be insufficient supply of places going forward as well. So this is where Engage comes from. And just going back to what Max was talking about yesterday, uh, about content creation tools, this is what Engage seeks to be. So Engage uh, provides remote distance learning, full teacher and presenter presence, full communication, both verbal and nonverbal, immersive learning environments, interactive learnings, and also allows simulations to be created and delivered collaboration tools, content creation tools, live recorded presentations, um, and 4D effects. And I'll very quickly explore some of those. So teacher presence is this concept, and I saw that a couple of sessions yesterday, is this concept that I may be in a MOOC with thousands of other participants, but I feel like the teacher is talking directly to me and that I feel like I'm getting customized education, I'm getting personal attention, and uh, as a result of that, uh, that will keep me more motivated and more involved in the education experience. So teacher presence is a key thing. Collaboration tools are key things as well, and this is just a simple one that, that, that we're showing here, which is the ability for people to be in different parts of the world, 
but to collaborate together. In this case, it's uh, uh, over putting a skeleton together. And you can have these two participants anywhere you want. And in fact, you can have as many people uh, interacting. And I'm, I'm not quite sure about the dancing, but uh, uh, you get this sense of collaboration. You're also seeing kind of 4D tools there as well. Uh, there's a feature called recorded playback, which is the capability for a, a teacher to record a lecture and then uh, play that back anytime they want for anybody. And this is both relevant in, a, in an education and a corporate training environment as well. Social learning groups are important to bring people together. Um, and you, you see in this particular model, they're coming together as avatars, they're looking at a historical uh, object, um, and they're engaged and they've got live voice and they're talking to each other about that as well. And much more powerful than kind of message board type situations or, or kind of Facebook interaction. And um, the company is currently working, so it's early days for this platform. So there's a, there's a big, strong technical platform built and it's, the company's now at the point where it's bringing that to market. It's engaging with universities in terms of additional tools that need to be built for content creation or for learners, and also the best way to structure learning experiences and content uh, through the platform as well. Um, and it's, it's working uh, with, with a number of very large universities. I'm sure everybody's familiar with Oxford University in the UK. It was recently ranked the number one university in the world. Um, and uh, even though you probably tell from my accent I'm Irish, I would like to highlight that the UK has, has in the top 10 of uh, universities in the world, it's got Oxford, it's got Cambridge, it's got UCL, and it's got Imperial. So the UK is a great place to, um, in, to create these types of platform and engage with the universities. So I'm just going to show you a quick video of some of the work the company's done with Oxford. Doctors at the University of Oxford are using virtual reality to train doctors in Africa. The technology is a low-cost way of providing training overseas that should lead to more lives being saved. David Lum reports. The virtual world this headset transports you to is a reality for doctors and nurses across Africa. In this scenario, a baby's unconscious. Select the best course of action to take to resuscitate the baby. Players need to make a choice. Will this breathing mask work? It's so difficult to give high quality training um, across huge countries such as Kenya where training centres are widely dispersed. With this type of approach you can essentially put uh, the expert in the room with people at, at huge distances um, and at relatively low cost. Children dying is a major problem in Africa. One in ten dies before their fifth birthday. It's hoped the headset can drastically reduce this. If we can improve life-saving skills for people, particularly around the newborn period, but also for older children, there's huge potential still to save lives. And for uh, that was a BBC um, news broadcast. I think that was from about six months ago. Um, so the company's gone on to work with a number of other universities. Um, one of the Royal College of, of Surgeons um, is uh, the, the primary body for, for teaching surgeons uh, surgical techniques in the UK and Ireland. Um, and obviously healthcare is a major area uh, for, for training. And the, the, it's not listed here, but the, the company's also working with the University of Washington in Seattle as well. Uh, on different ways of, of, of engaging and creating learning experiences. So uh, it's also uh, bringing out an enterprise uh, platform. And this is a platform uh, for kind of enterprise and industrial training. And um, let me just talk a bit about that. So it has a number of key aspects to it. Uh, remote distance simulated training. Uh, live and recorded meetings, collaboration tools and file sharing, screencasting, 360 video, uh, 4D effects, and uh, okay, so content creation tools as well. We and it's available in a couple of ways. Uh, um, it's, it's available both as a kind of an online platform that you'll be able to download from, uh, for example, Viveport from HTC. Uh, but it's also, um, if, if anybody's interested in, in trialing the platform, it's available for free from the company. 
and uh, you can you can get an SDK which will allow you to to use it. And there's a whole range of things you can do out of the box in terms of creating courses. But yeah, also, if you want to use Unity on top of that, you can build some simulations in Unity as well. So uh, I suppose um, I want to come back. That's an example of a company that's in the market right now that's doing education and learning. Um, and I kind of touched on some of the learnings that, that we've had in terms of how you engage with an early market. You know, as these headsets have been released, the company's been focused on cutting its cloth to um, the number of users out there uh, and growing the business over time. Uh, let's move forward now to this market really expanding. And uh, one of the things, and there was some discussion on this yesterday as well, so we, we look at this market as arriving much more quickly than we might appreciate right now. And every single day, it seems there's new announcements in this space. And I think part of, I suppose, one of the, and this was in David's introduction, one of the things that is very, very important to, to keep in mind is the huge investment that's going in. Investment from major software companies worldwide, investment from venture firms like ourselves, um, there, there's just so much investment going into this space, and the products are getting better and better the whole time, that this future will arrive. I have no doubt of, about that. Uh, the question is how quickly it will. And um, even, even though we've gone through that, that, you know, that hype cycle, uh, when you actually look at what's happening on the ground, there's a lot of things happening right now. So some of these we would have spoken about yesterday. The Google Glass 2.0. And I was at a couple of great uh, industrial sessions yesterday, as, um, and um, they were highlighting uh, experiments with Google Glass. Um, one of the things that's really interesting is uh, an announcement last week, I think, that Facebook plans to unveil a $200 wireless Oculus VR headset for, t for 2018. And that's untethered and doesn't require a PC. And I think that's a really, really interesting development. And it shows that the competitive dynamic is really accelerating technology development here, where you've got Facebook competing with HTC, competing with Microsoft, competing with Samsung. This is really going to propel technology forward very, very quickly. And then um, the middle picture there is of um, uh, an interaction designer who used the new Apple AR toolkit. Um, to put um, uh, the new Tesla 3 on his driveway. And, and actually, I, I probably should have included the video there, because the video is really, really impressive. That thing looks really real on, on his driveway. Um, so the software APIs and technologies are improving on AR quite dramatically as well. And then on the right-hand side, we're looking at Wired. And as long as I've been around, we've been waiting for Magic Leap to release a product. Um, and I just really hope it's a really, really good product, because we've been waiting for it for a while. Um, but I'm optimistic, uh, particularly because of the fact that uh, they're competing against Apple in this space. Uh, and and we, we also see some work from Microsoft in this space as well. So I'm very optimistic that over the next 12 months, we'll see the next wave, the second wave of hardware platforms emerge and that these will, be, these will be platforms that will drive adoption even further. Uh, we're also seeing great innovation in hand tracking. Uh, so on the left-hand side, we're seeing um, Valve have, has been distributing the Knuckles prototype, uh, and that's kind of similar to um, the Oculus hand controllers as well. Uh, Leap Motion just raised another 50 million for um, kind of visual hand tracking. Uh, and then the one on the right-hand side is a, is a still from a video of uh, Facebook's um, kind of VR gloves. And, and these are computer vision tracked gloves. Uh, and funny enough, actually, I, that's the one I'm actually least impressed with because I had, a, I had a grad student do a project like that a couple of years ago. It's actually pretty easy to take a glove, put some markers on it, and track it using computer vision, using OpenCV. Uh, but it's still great to see them working on it. And it's still great to see um, you know, hand tracking and hand presence is a very, very important thing for, uh, for VR and AR. And there's a variety of different technologies and approaches being developed in this space. It's great to see eye tracking move forward very, very quickly as well. Um, the picture on the left is Samsung. 
Um, uh, this is from Mobile World Congress in Barcelona earlier on this year. Uh, and this is a prototype that has hand and eye tracking for Samsung. Um, the middle picture shows the Fove, uh, which has um, uh, got eye tracking built in. And then the top one is uh, an acquisition that uh, Apple did uh, of an, a German eye tracking firm uh, for some future product that Apple is bringing out, potentially a glass product. And then on the right hand side is a partnership that HTC has done for eye tracking as well. And for the for everybody in the room, eye tracking is important for a variety of reasons. Um, one of those reasons is uh, for, the, for the tech people in the audience is for foveated rendering, which is basically allowing you to, uh, you know, as, as you get to um, more pixels, as you get to more and more realistic um, displays being put in front of your face in terms of a, a, a bigger density of pixels, uh, the processing power that you need to render all of that at 90 frames per second goes up really quite dramatically. And one of the ways of making that a little bit easier for the software is something called foveated rendering. If you can track the eyes, uh, then you can render the bit that the eyes are looking at in great detail, but the surrounding areas that the, that the eyes aren't focused on doesn't have to be rendered in the same amount of detail. So there's a technical reason for doing that, but there's a whole bunch of other reasons for doing eye tracking as well in terms, particularly in learning environments, to see what people are looking at, what they're focusing on, uh, and I know there's privacy concerns about that, and there's ethical concerns about that, uh, and, and these are issues that we need to uh, further develop in, in the VR and AR space as well. But from a technical point of view, it's an important technology. It's great to see that move forward. Uh, and then we've got the, um, the full body suits. They'll, they'll give you full body presence. Um, I, I, it's great to see that move forward. It's not an area where we're investing ourselves. I think there's so much that needs to be done before um, uh, we, we would invest in one of these areas. This is uh, something that we would see, you know, once there is very broad adoption of these technologies, then from an investor point of view, um, th these are investable propositions. Um, but this technology is moving quite quickly as well. And some of the, some of the earlier versions, um, so th the technologies here are, are AMUs, um, IMUs are used, uh, they have a combination of a gyroscope, uh, a magnetometer, and an accelerometer. And you basically put a whole bunch of these together on a suit, and it can track different parts of the body. One of the challenges with early suits is that IMUs tend to drift, so your fixed position in space drifts over time. And there's been great advances in the software that corrects that drifting in the modern suits as well. So a whole range of technical innovations are occurring right now and occurring very, very rapidly uh, that will really create an environment where, from a learning point of view, you know, great, uh, th these technologies can be really being used to provide incredible learning experiences and simulations. Uh, but also from a market point of view, it makes it easier for people like me to invest in software companies when I see all of this going on from a hardware point of view. And then can I just ask, who's read Ready Player One? Is there, yeah, lots of people have read it. Um, this is uh, the, the classic novel in this space. Um, the first, uh, it's been a while since I read this book, but I think around the first 80 to 100 pages talk about a future learning environment, people going to class, undergraduate and postgraduate um, in VR. And there's a, a movie coming out um, next year, and I'm going to show you a trailer first. I think in 2045, week. there's nowhere left to go. Nowhere except the Oasis. So the question I have is, if this is 2045, how quickly are we going to get there? Uh, I was born in 2025. I'll, I'll let you watch this. But I wish I'd grown up in the 1980s like all my heroes. I live here in Columbus, Ohio. In 2045, it's still ranked the fastest growing city on Earth, but it sure doesn't seem like it when you live in the stacks. They called our generation the missing millions. Missing not because we went anywhere. There's nowhere left to go. Nowhere except the Oasis. place that feels like I mean anything. A world 
where the limits of reality are your own imagination. that on there's a lot more in that that trailer I'd encourage you to go check it out I'd encourage you to read the book if you've not read it it's a it's a great read um, for me uh, uh, I, was, I, I love that book because it's got so so many 1980s um, pop culture references and makes me feel young again so it's a it's a great book and uh, Spielberg is directing the movie and Spielberg of course was uh, you know created so many of the the most famous movies back in the 1980s as well but there's a serious reason for showing that, which is that science fiction often influences our view of the future. And, and in, in terms of mediating the future, there's an interaction there. And this is a really significant science fiction novel that paints a future um, that is in some parts dystopian, but it does paint a future of how virtual reality will have an impact on the world, both in terms of the metaverse, um, but also in terms of learning as well. Um, and how we go about our daily life. And the thing about this is, um, even looking at the trailer of the movie and the, the VR headset, it looks like a Gear VR. It actually doesn't look that impressive. Um, so our expectations of the future are based upon what we know today. And I actually think a lot of this stuff is going to move far more quickly than we realize. And that's probably the message I want to take away, I hope you take away from this, which is, given the advances in technology, and given the level of investment in this space, it will move very, very quickly. And if you are, if you are uh, doing uh, kind of experiments in a corporate setting at the moment in terms of corporate training uh, or in terms of education, uh, I think the tools that you'll have available to you both on a hardware side and a software side are going to improve pretty, pretty dramatically from this point on. I do think we've reached a point where everything moves forward very, very quickly. And I think the next 12 months will be very, very interesting in this space. Um, so this, I wish I'd come up with this quote. This is not my quote. This is Chris Dixon from Andreessen. Uh, but this, uh, I think, epitomizes how I think of VR and AR. And I'll read it. Some people call VR the last medium, because any subsequent medium can be invented inside of VR, using software alone. Looking back from the future, the movie and TV screens we use today will be seen as an intermediate step between the invention of electricity and the invention of VR. Kids will think it funny that their ancestors used to stare at glowing rectangles, hoping to suspend disbelief. I just think that just highlights the potential of this space. It's very lofty, um, but I do believe that this is a major new platform, both AR, and VR, and MR, and I think it'll have profound effects on society. Um, both positive and also negative. Uh, and I guess it's our job to try and create as many positive impacts as possible using this technology. So that's it. Uh, thank you very much uh, for, uh, for listening to me. And I'll take any questions. I don't know if we, do we have time for questions. A few minutes for yeah. questions. So if anyone has a question. Thank you, Barry. That's a really uh, fascinating talk. And you talked about how they're monetizing this. And I just wondered if you can tell us who are kind of in this emerging space, how are they making money? Who's buying it? How is, this, how is that working? Yeah, so we have, we have really interesting data on monetization. If you, if you just take Apollo, for, for example, um, um, I, I, can't, I can't give out any numbers. But what I can say is that we're seeing console and PC drive significantly more revenue than mobile. And uh, there's a number of companies um, that I'm engaged with at the moment uh, regarding investment. And I've pushed them towards console and PC rather than mobile. Because we, we've seen to date revenues on mobile are virtually insignificant. Now, it doesn't mean that mobile revenues won't be there in the long run. But I think if you just, if you just think about the point in time, stage of development, we're seeing substantial revenues, for example, on PlayStation, HTC, and Oculus 
but we're seeing insignificant revenues on mobile at the moment. And, and that is something to bear in mind. And uh, pretty much in the order I describe them as well. So PlayStation is huge in terms of revenue potential. Um, I think HTC and Oculus, um, I, I think you know, there'll be a dynamic there. PlayStation is huge today. PlayStation, Oculus, when they have new products, that'll start to drive it as well. But right now, it's PlayStation, HTC, Oculus, and then mobile way down uh, in terms of, of uh, release. Uh, and that's for this product. I, I can't say it's going to be the same for every product. Um, but I think that's the assumption I'm working off of right now myself. Uh, in terms of the, the model, uh, Apollo is just, um, there's, models are pretty simple right now. So Apollo is something you pay for, you download it. Um, I, think, I, think, uh, I think it's like 10 bucks on, on, um, on PlayStation here in the US. Um, Titanic will be a little bit more expensive um, just because of the, there's more interactivity, more, you spend more time in there. On the education space, um, it's much more, um, on the distance learning, it's much more a, uh, a Coursera type model. It's free, if an educator wants to put up free content there and make it available to the world, it's absolutely free. Uh, but if somebody wants to charge for their content, uh, then it'll be an app store type model where the platform will take a cut. Um, similarly for, for enterprise right now, the platform is free. Uh, but if the enterprise wants um, a simulation built or some custom, uh, custom development, then that'll be charged on a services basis. So uh, I would say on, on the platform side, you can access that platform for free. You can put up content for free. You can use it for free. If you want to do something um, custom on it, uh, then, then typically you pay for it. And I think that's pretty similar as well, because I, I know I'm not sure if the Immerse guys are here, um, Immerse.io. Those guys are great guys as well, and they've got a great product, and I think they're probably operating off a very similar model to that also. Yeah. Thanks for the talk. Uh, I wonder if you can explore a little bit more the, uh, the, the, the VR-enabled MOOC. Is it a synchronous experience? How does social interaction occur in that environment peer-to-peer -peer and peer-to-instructor. Uh, Do I encounter an avatar who is my instructor? Does that person have to be present uh, in a synchronous fashion? Just I Great question. talk a little Great bit question. more about that. Yeah, and, I, and I, I don't think I adequately covered that in, in, uh, when I was going through it. So the, the concept behind this is that you are using avatars, and those avatars are becoming more and more sophisticated the whole time as well. And there's a concept that you'll have live lessons and that people will come in together and they can, uh, they're in the same environment and they can collaborate around those lessons. And then post those lesson, lessons, there's social spaces where they can interact and collaborate with it. The, the people attending those lessons can interact and collaborate. There's also the concept of, as an educator, I can upload content, uh, I can record myself and I can deliver that lecture online and then uh, you can either have it, have it available at a certain time or people can, um, can socialize together and rerun that lecture. So the teacher, if you like, or, or the instructor um, is not there physically present but appears to be for the lecture um, and then can maybe come in later afterwards and run uh, some office hours or things like that around it as well. So there's kind of two dual modes. And the company's experimenting with both of those modes at the moment, both the pre-recorded uh, and then also the live lectures as well. Um, and they're getting different experiences with both. Um, I mean, obviously, the, the, the key thing I think it provides in, in the live experience is that you can have lots of people come in at the same time, um, but you can feel like, and even though you can see that the, the teacher or the instructor is talking directly to you. And that's probably the most powerful thing I've seen. And then also the social interaction around it uh, is important as well. But of course, one of the things we've seen as a result of that, because that social interaction is enabled, uh, there needs to be some protections there uh, and some um, filtering mechanisms around that also. Uh, so sti they're still experimenting with it, but both kind of modes are used at the moment. Thank you very much. This is really a fantastic keynote. And um, I'm just wondering, you mentioned 4D a couple of times, and I'm just wondering what's going on in that space. 4D? 4D, yep. Yeah. So 4D are, um, that's really kind of an asset store. So as, a, as an educator, 
um, you can go to you can go to uh, an online store and bring in assets. So a good example of an asset would be, and I think Immerse has got a great demo of this as well, um, for a pharma company, which is a pill machine, where powder goes in one end and pills come out the other, and it, it's kind of like a sophisticated photocopier where you can you can open it up and pull out cartridges and things like that. So what, what the company sees as kind of 4D effects are, are really models. It's another way of saying there's a whole series of canned models that you can, you can pull and make available in an education environment. So, it's, so they probably should call them models rather than 4D effects, but they have some other kind of things related to that as well. <laughs>